All right, folks. So one of the questions that I'm often asked by hams who want to increase their knowledge, experience level, or understanding of amateur radio and amateur radio antennas is what book should I get? What book should I read? I'm kind of nerdy and I have a lot of books, so I thought I would do a video on one that I got somewhat recently and have been uh, looking through. This is the uh, Radio Amateur Handbook, and it's by a ham called William Orr and Stuart Cowan. And uh, William Orr's books come highly recommended, which is why I picked this one up. Uh, we can take a look at the back of it, and it says all kinds of wonderful things, and it has a testimony from somebody who read it. And it, look, it says price seven ninety five. Now, you can probably find this book. You're going to have to find it used, obviously. It's uh, no longer in print for about 10 to 15 bucks, give or take. And one of the things I wanted to show inside, it looks like this one belonged to a library at some point, is that this book was printed in 1984. So that makes it 40 years old. The copyright is from 1978. So it was originally written more than 40. Now, one of the things I want to mention is that the fundamentals of RF haven't changed in the last 40 years and even longer than that. But uh, we have learned things in that time, and also the technologies that we use and some of the tools that we use to do analysis of things like antennas and how we build radios has changed. So most of the information in this book is perfectly fine and valid, but every now and then you'll come across something that doesn't quite make sense or it'll suggest using equipment that hams typically don't use any longer. The reason I say typically is I'm sure somebody in the comments is going to say, I use that equipment, I use it all the time. And that may be true, but uh, it's more difficult to find some of that equipment in the new marketplace that we exist in today as modern hams. So I zoomed in a little bit here just so we could take a quick look at the table of contents. And you can see that there's an introduction to DX antennas that work, which is fantastic because we don't want to use antennas that don't work. Antenna location is a factor of performance. Antenna performance in the famous SWR meter. Antenna towers and rotors. My favorite chapter, all about balance. Uh, popular vertical antennas. He goes into some information about quads, uh, delta quads and other loops. Horizontal and sloping wire antennas, and that's where they talk about N-fed half waves, which I like. Talks about HF beam antennas and all about them. And then talks about some VHF beam antennas. And there are some plans in here for how to build those. So it's a pretty comprehensive book. It's about 150 pages. The print's a little small because it's a little bit of a small book, but uh, don't let that discourage you. So I'm just going to go ahead and look at some of the bookmarks that I put in here, and we can see what I highlighted. So here is uh, page 8, and he talks a little bit about the test equipment that you should have. And what I wanted to do is come over here to the recommendation. I think this recommendation still holds true. You can see some of the equipment here is a little bit older. Um, these are bird watt meters, still very, very popular. It's pretty expensive, but uh, people love these things. But what he says is to buy the best SWR meter that you can afford. You'll achieve the most accurate results. Uh, one type made in the USA, good luck with that. Um, with plugins is especially useful for both HF and VHF antenna measurements. While the author does not believe in blatantly plugging name brands, he be assured that this high-flying instrument is really a bird. So he's talking about the bird watt meter right here. But then he talks about uh, a dip meter, and I don't own a dip meter, and I don't know if I know anybody personally who owns one. Uh, I have seen them, and you can make them. They're not that difficult using uh, certain test equipment that you have, but uh, I don't think that I would recommend a dip meter these days. Maybe use a nano VNA or uh, some other type of equipment along those lines. So there is a section here on antenna gain and all about it, and this is really helpful. So when I get a book like this, I typically don't read the book cover to cover. Now, I'll look through it and find areas that I'm interested in, like antenna gain, and I'll read that. But I usually use these books as reference-type material. But uh, he goes over here, and he talks something about uh, something that's dear to my heart, uh, inflated antenna claims. And he talks about antenna manufacturers are competing for your hard-earned dollars, dollars, just like automob automobile dealers. And I think on the next page, he talks a little bit about some things to watch out for. And he says here, a word, so a word to the wise, a word to the dollar wise amateur. Forget imposing in meaningless terms and antenna gain that are designed to separate you from your hard earned money. And he really just talks a lot about how antenna manufacturers will use marketing gimmicks and terms to try to make you think that their antenna is something special or more special than it really is. He goes into the truth about antenna, uh, antenna gain, and it's pretty interesting stuff. The next thing that we have uh, bookmarked is some information about antenna locations, and this is a pretty good part to read, and he talks a lot about um, ground loss and ground conductivity, and you can learn about that here. 
And then he goes into more detail and he talks about things that you should do when you're mounting your or locating your antenna and some things to be considered uh, in your in your decisions. And then uh, he got, talks about ground loss with vertical antennas. I know a lot of folks like to use DX commanders and Wolf River coil type antennas. Vertical antennas like that, and he talks a lot about the ground plane and tuned radial systems or counterpoises, and it's pretty pretty informational. In chapter three, he talks about antenna performance in the famous SWR meter, and he has something here called the uh, truth table, and it's really helpful. It's it's right here, and it talks about different antenna types. So like you have your isotropic radiator, ground planes, half wing dipole antennas. And then he gives you gain figures for those antennas. And so this is pretty helpful if you're determining what type of antenna you want to build or buy. And then also if you're looking to buy an antenna and you want to compare the claims of gain against that. And in this, he talks a lot about how gain is measured and how you determine it. So it's pretty helpful. Under antenna performance, he talks a little bit about what the SWR meter tells you, how to interpret the results. In today's world, when you use things like nano VNAs or even rig experts, you can see things like polar plots that give you more information than just SWR. You can look at inductance and capacitance values. So it's pretty handy. Uh, over here, he shows a little bit about inline SWR meters, which I recommend everybody have. And it talks about how you want to use them and how you connect them to your antenna system. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because I don't have a tower or a rotor. But uh, he talks about towers, fixed towers. Uh, I think there's some information in here about fold-over towers, different tower components, how you want to mount these. Now, you should, if you're putting up a big old tower, consult your local ordinances and laws about installing stuff like this in your environment. But uh, he gives a ton of information about different types of towers and what you may want to consider if you were going to erect a tower. So chapter five uh, is all about balance. And so I wanted to just mention the second paragraph that says balance antenna requires two conductor feed line carrying equal and opposing currents to the antenna to establish electrical symmetry and prevent radiation of energy from the feed line. What he's talking about there is common mode current. So that's why we talk about balance and chokes a lot on the uh, channel. And uh, he says here, a completely balanced antenna system radiates from uh, only the antenna. There's no radiation at all coming from the transmission line. And then he goes in and talks about the coaxial cable, which is actually three conductors. And he talks a little bit about using balanced feed line, like ladder line or window line, and comparing that to um, coaxial cable, which is unbalanced. And he goes into more and more information about it. And there was something in here that I found uh, quite controversial. And so what he says here is, in one instance, it is not necessary to use a ballon and better overall antenna performance is obtained without the ballon. The case in point is a dipole antenna for the lower frequencies. In a typical example, the 80 meter dipole fed directly by a coaxial line will benefit um, without the benefit of a ballon. Antenna, flows, antenna currents flow on the outside of the coaxial line, which causes the radiation of a vertically polarized wave and then drops the vertically down the antenna. So what's interesting about this is Dave Kassler, who is a fantastic ham and he's a fantastic YouTube creator. I've learned so much about amateur radio from him. One time he was telling a story about uh, how he doesn't really use balance on dipoles and doesn't really believe in them. And he was saying that he was at some event and they had, I want to say it was a 40 meter, but it might have been an 80 meter dipole that was very high up in the air. And they just weren't getting their signal out. And what he did is, is that he, he got in an argument with his buddy who was there about the ballon. He wanted to remove it and see how it was going to work. So he said when the guy wasn't looking, he snuck up there, took the ballon out, and all of a sudden the antenna started working. So here you can see uh, polar, or you can see radiation patterns of the antenna. This one is a dipole with a ballon. And when you have that, you can see that you have nulls. This is typically what you would see. These lobes are your radiation pattern as it leaves the broad side of the antenna, but at the ends of your antenna elements, you have uh, null spots, which you cannot receive or transmit on. So what this uh, William Moore is saying here is, is that if your antenna is mounted high enough at the correct height, and you do want to use the shield of your coaxial cable as part of your antenna system, don't use the ballon, and it removes these nulls and adds gain in these north-south directions. I wouldn't do that. I'd just rotate my dipole or I would set up a different antenna. But in the event that you do want to operate without a bound, I just found that to be a pretty educational and enlightening piece here in this book. Chapter six goes through popular vertical antennas, which is pretty nice and handy. And he really goes into a lot of information about these ground plane antennas. Now I've built these for two meters and they work extremely well. 
Uh, after reading through this, I'm thinking about building one for 10 meters because it would still be small enough and manageable enough to fit in the backyard, but uh, we'll see. And uh, he talks a lot about um, the ground plane being elevated off of the ground. This one you can see is fed with coaxial line, but then he has tune radials here, which you need to do unless you have ground-mounted radials. Here under vertical antennas, he talks a lot about this 5 8 wave um, antenna. And we actually did a video modeling 5 8 wave vertical antennas uh, with MMANA gal. Um, so looking at this was pretty handy. Now on this one, what they do have, you can see right here, is a adjustable inductor at the bottom of the antenna. We use an inductor to make an antenna look electrically longer than it really is. But he goes through the ground plane and he talks about uh, the different bands and what size uh, antenna that you want. But the idea here, this vert this adjustable inductor is pretty, pretty interesting. Chapter seven uh, is quads, delta quads, and other loop antennas. And um, we did a show on coffee and ham radios. Where we talked a little bit about loops on the ground antennas. So it was uh, nice reading through this uh, beforehand and then just getting some ideas for that conversation. But he talks a little bit about uh, horizontal and, polar and uh, vertical polarization and how to understand that. And then there's one here that I found pretty interesting. So with this, you can see these are called delta loop antennas. This one has the point at the top. This one has the point at the bottom, the feed point at the top, and a feed point at the bottom. So you can see that a, a, a delta loop with a feed point at the top is probably a pretty good NVIS antenna. Uh, with the feed point at the bottom, this is probably something that you would want to use for regional, um, I'm sorry, for uh, DX type communications. Chapter 8 talks about horizontal and sloping wire antennas. And, and in the beginning of this, they talk about dipoles a lot and then using dipoles on a slope. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that that's something that I would do. Uh, you can, but um, I like more of the NFED type antennas, and I believe that is right here. So here's where he talks about um, NFED antennas. Here we go, NFED wire provides two-band operation, wires trimmed for SWR. This is... Um, not the same type of <laughs> feds that we use, but uh, this is still good information. He talks about different antenna designs. So here's the K6UB and then the WA4JQS. Um, so it's pretty good read. Chapter 9 talks about beam antennas, uh, some popular beam antennas. And he goes in here, talks about Yagi uh, antennas and quad beams, uh, beams and some of the different things about them. Here are some charts about the, uh, the gain of these beam antennas. And here's a bunch of information about the Yagi beam antenna. One thing that I find funny is 40 years ago, it was still okay to refer to the Yagi as the Yagi, named after Dr. H. Yagi. Now everybody wants to show how smart they are by calling it the Yagi Uda, because Uda was the guy who worked for Yagi. And apparently he was a key contributor who doesn't get enough credit. Chapter 10 talks about VHF beams that you can build. And the one I thought was really interesting is right around... And this is a log periodic Yagi. And uh, here are some dimensions for building this. Here are some dimensions for building the quad Yagi. For building the quad G. I don't even know how you say that, but it's got a, it's got a quad loop in here and directors and reflectors. So it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, all these different antennas that you can build. And I guess you could really get your, your VHF signals out doing this. And the last thing I wanted to point out was um, this... Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out is William has a bunch of other books and he kind of plugs and promos those at the end of the book, the same way we plug videos at the end of YouTube videos. Um, overall, like I said, I think I paid probably about 12 bucks for this book, but uh, it's definitely worth it in my opinion. And I, I really do enjoy reading some of these older books because I do feel that we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us and just understanding the history of some of these antennas and the, and the way that amateur radio used to work will make you a better radio uh, operator these days. Anyhow, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching, everybody.